Hello again, everyone. Welcome to Washington Gun Law TV. I am Washington Gun Law President William Kirk. Thanks for joining us. Well, as we know, in the last several months, the ATF has been completely losing its mind. Whether it's solvent traps, suppressors, silencers, Form 1s, Form 4s, AR pistols that they're trying to reclassify into SBRs. Yes, the ATF has collectively lost their mind. And if you think it's bad now, just you wait because we have more in store for you. So today we're going to have to spend a few minutes talking about how the ATF is about to make everyone's life miserable. Okay, before we get rolling, you guys know the drill. If you like this video, go ahead and click that like button down below if you want to stay up to date on issues related to your Second Amendment rights, not only here in the state of Washington, but anywhere in this great nation of ours. Go ahead and click that subscribe button. Click the little bell logo if you want to be notified when we post new videos. And most importantly, let's keep the comments and discussions coming. That's how we're making sure that we're getting our videos out to more lawful and responsible gun owners like yourself. Okay, as reported on March 22nd of this year by the reputable news outlet ABC News, um, we are at a point, a precipice now, where we are about to get a whole new slew of regulations and statutory definitions designed for the ATF to bring a considerable amount of more firearms and firearm components under their control. The headline by ABC News was titled, Proposed Ghost Gun Rule Could Reshape Battle Against Homemade Guns. And while that is a neat little catchy headline and nice little clickbait, no, actually when we take a look at what the ATF is proposing here, they're doing a lot more than that. Now, before we get too far down the road, and I'm going to let you know I'm going to hit you with a lot of information. You're going to get a lot of information slides. This is coming directly from the ATF. But let's, in a nutshell, tell you what they're trying to do. Well, uh, gun control, as most of you know, is actually not about the guns, it's about the control. And what the ATF and our current administration is clearly trying to do is to expand the definitions found within certain federal codes to encapsulate more firearms and more firearm components and more activities under the purview of that law. Why? Because then your federal government will have more control of it. And in advancing these goals, and this is what we all need to be aware of. Yeah, are they going to make our lives miserable for you, the lawful and responsible gun owner nationwide? Yes, they are. But I'll tell you who they're going to make life even a little bit more miserable for is your FFLs nationwide. Now, all of the information that I'm about to give you, it comes directly off the ATF's website. And I will put a link down below in the description box for where this information came from. But take a look at the very first opening salvo here from the ATF when they talk about what they intend on doing with this proposed rulemaking. ATF's proposed rule would, one, provide new definitions of firearm frame or receiver and fr frame or receiver. Amend the definition of firearm to clarify when firearm parts kit is considered a firearm and gunsmith to clarify the meaning of that term and to explain that gunsmiths may be licensed solely to mark firearms for unlicensed persons. It's also meant to provide definitions for complete weapon, complete muffler or silencer device, privately made firearm PMF, and readily it's also necessary to provide a definition of importers or manufacturer serial number, provide a deadline for making firearms manufactured, clarify marking requirements for firearm mufflers and silencers, and amend the format for records of manufacture and acquisition and dis disposition by manufacturers and importers, and finally amend the time periods records must be retained at the licensed premises. So in a nutshell, yes, what are we doing? We are expanding the definitions of everything so we can encapsulate more components, more items, and more activity under the purview of federal law. And we are also mandating that all FFLs maintain much greater ranges of records for much longer periods of time. Why? Well, I'm sure so that the ATF can carefully investigate them. 
Now, for those of you who've been watching our channel for a while, you will know that in the last few months, we have spent considerable amount of time talking about what the Washington State Legislature has been doing out here to deprive our citizens of their Second Amendment rights. And one of the bills that recently passed was House Bill 1705. Now, I will link up a couple of videos that I've done for them, and we've done a lot of videos on House Bill 1705. Uh, that legislation, when it goes into effect this July, will actually ban all untraceable firearms and 80% lowers. Now, there's a lot of unique aspects that relate to um, state law. And I, again, I'm putting the links for the videos down below. We don't want to get too far off the beaten path. But if you want to see exactly what the federal government is trying to do here, you look no further than what Washington State has already done through House Bill 1705. Now, right off the gate, what the ATF wants to do is significantly expand their definition of frame or receiver so that more components fall under the purview of the definition of a firearm, which then, of course, requires serial numbers, tracking numbers, and so forth. The ATF specific statement states, under the proposed rule, a frame or receiver is any externally visible housing or holding structure for one or more fire control components. A fire control component is one necessary for the firearm to initiate, complete, or continue the firing sequence, including, but not limited to, any of the following. Hammer, bolt, bolt carrier, breech block, cylinder, trigger mechanism, firing pin, striker, or slide rails. And the new regulation also states, any firearm part falling within the new definition that is identified with a serial number must be presumed absent an official determination by ATF or other reliable evidence to the contrary to be a frame or receiver. But here's where the deviation really starts taking place because the ATF realizes that technology has long since advanced the statutory language. And so what the ATF is trying to do is play a game of catch up with the firearm industry because they go on to state more than one externally visible part may house or hold a fire control component on a particular firearm such as with a split or modular frame or receiver under these circumstances atf may determine whether a specific part or parts of the weapon is the frame or receiver which may include an internal frame or chassis at least partially expo exposed to the exterior to allow identification so yes, as technology advances, that's okay because the ATF will just get to determine for themselves and we know how consistent they are in their rulemaking, about as consistent as they are in their rule interpreting uh, as to what will constitute a firearm moving forward. Now listen, these proposed rules may sound new to you, but they don't sound new to any of us out here in Washington State because again, like I say, I'll post the link to House Bill 1705. This is the exact type of language that we used in the implementation of that law. Now, another common theme that we're going to see throughout all of these proposed new regulations is the burden that's being placed on the FFL. When it comes to frames and receivers, ATF's official statement reads, The proposed rule maintains current classifications and marking requirements of firearm frames or receivers, except that licensed manufacturers and importers must mark on new designs or configurations either their name or recognize the abbreviation and the city and state or recognize the abbreviations where they maintain their place of business or their name or recognize the abbreviation and their abbreviated ffl number on each part defined as a frame or receiver along with the serial number so all firearms manufacturers and ffls are going to be placed on notice that they are going to have far more marking requirements now in addition to what they're talking about on frames and receivers, and many of you know about this already, they're going after these part kits and they're going after them with a vengeance. Many of you purchased Form 1 kits in the last year to build yourself a suppressor. You assumed, because they were called Form 1 kits, that what you needed to do was fill out, shockingly, an ATF Form 1. However, many of you have now either been rejected or gotten a nice little follow-up letter from the ATF where they want more information. The reason is, is because the ATF is clearly declaring war on any of these Form 1 kits. 
And to make sure that this falls under the purview of federal legislation, the ATF is proposing to do in the federal laws exactly what the state of Washington did in our revised Code of Washington, which is not only to expand the definition of frame or receiver, but then to also expand the definition of readily or readily available so that now simple chunks of aluminum can be determined to be literally completed frames and receivers, thus following under all of the regulations set forth either in federal or state law. The ATF explains it this way. The proposed rule explains that when a partially complete frame or receiver parts kit has reached the stage in manufacture where it may be readily completed, assembled, converted, or restored to a functional state, it is a frame or receiver that must be marked. And the ATF further states, weapon parts kits with partially complete frames or receivers and containing the necessary parts such that they may be readily completed, assembled, converted, or restored to expel a projectile by the action of an explosives are firearms for which each frame or receiver of the weapon would need to be marked. So what does this mean to you, the lawful and responsible gun owner nationwide? What it means is, is that an 80% lower, or what we call out here in Washington, an untraceable firearm, or what they are now calling under this legislation of personally made firearms, are now illegal unless they are marked and serialized. What does that mean? Well, the only way that your untraceable firearm can remain legal is it needs to become a traceable firearm. Now, one of the nice things, I guess, about this proposed rulemaking is, is we have finally gotten away with the term ghost gun, which, as we know, is a liberal label given by mainstream media to talk about firearms which are otherwise untraceable. Attorney General Merrick Garland, always a wizard with the euphemisms, has decided to now call these PMFs or personally made firearms. But make no mistake about it, the ATF does have a big problem with them because their statement reads, Under the proposed rule, licensed manufacturers and importers must identify each part defined as a frame or receiver or specific parts determined by the ATF of each firearm they manufacture or import with a serial number, licensee's name or recognized abbreviation where they maintain their place of business, or their name, and abbreviated federal firearms license number as a prefix followed by a hyphen and then followed by a number as a suffix. And if that's not enough, there is yet more restrictions and burdens placed upon manufacturers, including each part defined as a frame or receiver, machine gun or firearm muffler or firearm silencer that is not a component part of a complete weapon or device at the time it is sold, shipped, or otherwise disposed of by the licensee must be identified with a serial number and all additional identifying information except that the model designation and caliber or gauge may be omitted if that information is unknown at the time the part is identified. And finally, just to make sure that you understand what's happening here, the final part of that statement reads, Licensees must mark complete weapons or frames or receivers disposed of separately, as the case may be, no later than seven days following the date of completion of the active manufacturing process or prior to disposition, whichever is sooner. So what does this mean? Well, there really won't be any Form 1 kits in the future. They're all going to be Form 4 kits because what they are basically saying is, is, hey, listen, any part that's designed to be part of a Form 1, we're going to consider that to be the completed whatever it is, the frame, the receiver, the firearm, the silencer, the suppressor, whatever it may be. And now manufacturers are going to be required to serialize all of these. Now, for those of you who have been watching this channel for a while, you know that we've talked an awful lot about solvent traps and mass Form 1 rejections. And clearly the ATF has completely lost their mind when it comes to suppressors. But not to disappoint, because in the new proposed legislation, they have more for us, including... Under the proposed rule, a frame or receiver of a firearm muffler or silencer device is defined as a housing or holding structure for one or more essential internal components of the device, including, but not limited to, baffles, baffling material, or expansion chambers. 
So you, you begin to see where they're going. Like any component, any component of what could possibly be a suppressor is now actually going to be considered a suppressor. But wait, there's more, including manufacturers and makers of complete muffler or silencer devices need only mark each part or specific parts previously determined by the ATF of the device defined as a frame or receiver under this rule. However, individual muffler or silencer parts must be marked if they are disposed of separately from a complete device unless transferred by qualified manufacturers to other qualified licensees for the manufacture or repair of a complete device. So what you're seeing with these mass form one rejections is an early implementation of this of this law. What they're saying is, is listen, if you're buying these kits, every part has to be serialized. And if it's not, it's not legal. And if you build it with those parts, you ain't legal. And that's why you're beginning to, one of the many reasons why you're beginning to see this mass Form 1 rejections it is an implementation of this policy. Okay, and then finally, as if there's not enough, this legislation is also going to place a considerable additional burden upon all FFLs nationwide as it comes to record keeping because now the ATF is going to basically demand record keeping in perpetuity. Why would they do that? Well, I think we can all figure out why they want to have as complete records as humanly possible. But according to the ATF, this is what they say. Under the proposed rule, a privately made firearm, it's a firearm, including a frame or receiver assembled or otherwise produced by a person other than a licensed manufacturer and without a serial number or other identifying markings placed by a licensed manufacturer at the time the firearm was produced. This term does not include an NFA registered firearm or one made before October 22nd, 1968. And so that's an important thing because in Washington, our law actually only applies to any untraceable firearm made July 1st, 2019 or later. This legislation applies to any firearm that's untraceable manufactured after October 22nd, 1968. But here's the big rub on the FFL, because here's what the ATF is saying. Licensees now must, one, properly mark each PMF acquired before the effective date of this rule within 60 days after the rule becomes final or before the final date of disposition. Two, properly mark previously acquired PMFs themselves or may arrange to have another licensee mark the firearm on their behalf. PMFs currently in inventory that a licensee chooses not to mark may also be destroyed or voluntarily turned into law enforcement within the 60-day period. Always very gracious of the ATF to allow you to surrender your weapons. But wait, there's more, including... 3. Once the rule becomes final, and unless already marked by another licensee, properly mark each PMF within 7 days following the date of receipt or other acquisition or before the date of disposition, whichever is sooner. Four, mark PMFs acquired after the rule becomes effective themselves or under their direct supervision by another licensee with the supervising licensee's information. Five, mark PMFs with the same serial number on each frame or receiver of a weapon that begins with the FFL's abbreviated license number as a prefix followed by a hyphen on any privately made firearm as defined that the licensee acquired, and finally six, record PMFs in their acquisition and disposition records, whether or not kept overnight, and update their acquisition entries with information marked on PMFs. What they're basically saying is, listen, if you have a personally made firearm, you have to mark it. If you're an FFL and you come across a personally made firearm that's not marked, you got to mark it. If you come across a personally made firearm that was marked, you need to keep record of it. Okay, and then finally, and I know that this is a lot of material, there is a whole new slew of requirements for record retention for FFLs as well, because the ATF is now saying... Under the proposed rule, all licensees must retain forms, including ATF Forms 4473, and acquisition and disposition records until the business or license activity is discontinued. Yes, record keeping now for the perpetuity of your company's existence, but there's even more, including...
Paper forms and records over 20 years of age may be stored in a separate warehouse, which is considered part of the licensed premises and subject to inspection. Paper acquisition and disposition records stored separately are those that do not contain any open disposition entries and with no dispositions recorded within 20 years. So as you can see, when we take a look at what the federal government is proposing here, what the ATF is proposing with their rulemaking, and by the way, when you compare it to what Washington State did under House Bill 1705, much of it is quite similar, but the federal government is clearly going much further. This is going to place a tremendous burden on lawful and responsible gun owners nationwide. It's also going to uh, place a tremendous burden on the FFL industry nationwide. Now, there is some more regulations that I'm not going to bore you with today. We will do a separate video about the actual way we have to go about marking these firearms. But candidly, if I'm an FFL, why would I want to get involved with this stuff and subject myself to more ATF scrutiny? So I think that what we're going to run into is a situation where many lawful, responsible gun owners want to serialize their firearms in order to keep them lawfully owned. And they're going to have a difficult, if not impossible, time finding a person to do it. Like I said, we will do more videos on this. This is really just scratching the surface. We're going to do a couple more videos where we'll really get into some of the devilish details that's in it. Listen, you may have more questions about what the ATF is doing or anything else related to your Second Amendment rights. And if you do, don't ever hesitate to contact us at WashingtonGunLaw.com. Or, of course, you can call us directly at 425-765-0487. Now, let's remember... Part of being the lawful and responsible gun owner, like we talk about all the time here at Washington Gun Law, is to know what the law is in every situation and how it applies to you in any instance that you may find yourself. Until next time, thanks for watching. Stay safe.